Good morning, Crossroads family. I just want to start out by saying a couple things. I want to say thank you to Kurt and Katie for how they have served us all along through this season, many other Crossroads leaders, including you, Jamie, uh, as we have been waiting and trusting on God entirely during this unprecedented season. Bless you. Bless Kurt and Katie. Um, if you want to, maybe this week, send off a text to them and just let them know how much they mean to us. I just also want to say I appreciate how Pastor Kurt and Pastor Coy and Justin now as well have all shared these challenges and reminders through Psalm 1, Psalm 91, last week Pastor Justin through Psalm 27. And I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to what the Lord's going to speak to us, the Holy Spirit has for us over the summer. It's been good. But I have to say, Sue and I simply miss you. Though we've Zoom Zoomed with each other over the summer, that's been good. And the masks, Jamie, your mask is really handsome back there. But being with you, worshiping with you, breaking bread, let's just say it's not been the same over these last three and a half months. But God is still on the throne. He is good all the time. Okay, we need to do that again. You didn't speak up loud enough. So, God is good all the time. Great. You did a wonderful job on that, although it's absolute silence here. I'd like us to begin with prayer. And in our praying, I'm going to ask a favor. Whether you are in a group, whether you're here at Crossroads in the auditorium, whether you're at one of the host homes, whether you're just with your family or you're with a friend, maybe you're simply alone wherever you're at now, right now watching and streaming this video, we have the Holy Spirit with us, and I'm going to ask a favor. Only if you're able and comfortable, I would ask you, in your immediate families or friends, if you'd be willing to hold hands. Another thing that you can do is just right where you're seated is lay your hands on your lap, palms up, like in a receiving mode. And I'd like us to wait on the Spirit to be our guide this morning, to be our comforter. It says in John, He is our guide, our comforter, our counselor, our teacher. And we're going to ask Him to teach us this morning in all truth regarding this very powerful psalm. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I may not be with my Crossroads family in person, but I am with them in spirit. And wherever they're seated right now, whoever they are with, even if they're all alone, you are present. And I'm asking you to be our teacher and our guide and our comforter and to minister to us the presence of the Holy Spirit, your power, your authority, the fact that you are in control. And we come to you and we seek your face and we ask God, just like you did to David, just like you did to Moses, just like you did to Abraham, just like you did to Isaac and Jacob, just like you did to Paul, to Peter. Would you speak to us? Speak to us through your word. May it be living sharper than any two-edged sword. May the familiarity that many of us have with this psalm, may it just dissipate to the truth and the power of what you want to say to me, what you want to say to each of us. And together we said, in the powerful name of Jesus, amen. I'd like to read to you from a paraphrase, or not a paraphrase, a translation that we may not as, be as familiar with. It's called the Christian Standard Bible. And the reason I'm doing this is because of the familiarity that many of us have with Psalm 46. And you're welcome to open your Bibles now to Psalm 46 in whatever translation you have, 
you're welcome to follow along. But if you're so familiar with it and you'd like to hear it in a slightly different rendering, pay careful attention to how this translation handles this passage. God is our refuge and strength a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid, though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the depths of the sea, though its water roars and foams and mountains quake with its turmoil. Selah. There is a river. Its streams delight the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is within her. She will not be toppled. God will help her when the morning dawns. Nations rage, kingdoms topple, the earth melts when he lifts his voice. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. Come, see the works of the Lord who brings devastation on the earth. He makes wars cease throughout the earth. He shatters bows and cuts spears in pieces. He sets wagons ablaze. Stop fighting and know that I am God, exalted among the nations, exalted on the earth. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. I'm gathering that you detected by now that Psalm 46 is divided into three sections, three stanzas. And each of them ends with a phrase depending on what, how your Bible is put together, the way the ink is put on the paper. But mine says, Selah. What does that phrase, Selah, mean? Well, Selah is not only the name of the Burmeister's youngest child, one of the stars of Some Good News. Selah, you're doing a great job. But it's a musical or poetic phrase, and it stands for to hold to pause for a moment and contemplate what was just said, what was just sung. A paraphrase might be, whoa, that's good stuff. I need to ponder that. So if you were to do a quick view of Psalm 46, let me do a quick run through. When the mountains quake, the Lord is our refuge and our strength. Selah. When nations are in uproar and kingdoms fall, the Lord Almighty is with us. Selah. Stop your fighting and know that I am God. Exalted among the nations, the Lord of armies is with us. Selah. Let's now practice Selah and pause and process what David is trying to convey in the three stanzas of this psalm. The first one, verses 1 through 3. The Lord is my refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way. You know, in this area of the United States, in the state of Michigan, in this area, we may not be going through a natural disaster that we presently are in a fearful of. We've all heard of what's been happening throughout the United States and abroad when it comes to natural disasters. But what there has been in our lives have been physical ailments and certainly a viral pandemic. It has been very, very, If it's not just been the political polarization 
that's deeply troubling our soul, souls, it's also been a painful season of emotional, verbal, and racial injustice. Assaults that have grieved our spirits. And it's not just within our nation. Other worlds are watching our behavior. We've witnessed the horrific video segments, but things that have been less visible to the human eye and maybe not getting publicity is the suffering that people are going through in this season financially, maritally, loss of employment. So right now, let's say la. I want us to ponder something. Right now at this time in history, our nation and our world is being rocked by the COVID-19 pandemic. There is world starvation, much of which we don't hear and get press on. But in other parts of undeveloped countries, people are not getting the virus. They're starving to death. There is recession and unemployment and closings of businesses and properties and investments that no longer are going to make it. And then this is all compounded by this frenzy and political mudslinging, all to be escalated by the continued racial injustice of God's own creation. Our black brothers and sisters who matter so much to God. Yet only three short months ago, we, we as a nation, we in our commercials, we in our publications, we were proclaiming that our human efforts would make everything better again. How's mankind been doing for the last three months, can I ask? Can we all take a deep look at our souls? See, Psalm 46 begins with two things to keep in mind. Number one, God is very present in all of our troubles, whom we can run to him. And second, we have an internal source of strength, a stronghold, by which we can face the uncertainty of our future. Justin, you were so spot on right last week. The Lord is the light, is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? The Lord is the stronghold of our lives. Of whom shall we be afraid? But I have to ask, are we looking to him? I mean, really looking to him. So dependent, so glued to his heartbeat, his face, his words. If you recall when Kurt opened up the series of Psalm and then he and Pastor Coy and Pastor Justin shared the Psalms from Psalm 91 and Psalm 1, they both used metaphors, allegories, comparisons. Why? Because David is a visual kind of guy. He's poetic. He's really visceral with his use of words. But he also is an outdoorsman. He's a shepherd. He's brave and valiant. So now I want to come to this second stanza of Psalm 46. There is a river. Its streams delight the city of God. The holy place of the Most High. God is within her. She will not be toppled. God will help her when the morning dawns. Nations will rage. Kingdoms topple. But the earth melts. The earth melts at the lifting of his voice. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Do you and I have that kind of 
place in our soul that David referred to? Have we, have we asked, like Justin's psalm last week, have we asked the Lord, Lord, there is one thing I seek of you, to dwell in your house and to gaze into the beauty of your face day after day after day. You see, David knew the beauty and joy of an intimate bond with the Father. His bond, his relationship was so intense, nothing was going to budge it. Nothing. I had to ask myself in preparing this psalm, does this describe me? Yes, nations are going to rage. Kingdoms are going to topple. But the earth melts at the lifting of his voice. The Lord of armies is with us. Repeat that. The Lord of armies is with us. Does this dependency, does this intensity of David's relationship with God, does it reflect how much I listen to him? Do I, is his voice the predominant message and song and lyric and text and website? Is it what consumes my heart and my mind? Some of you know who the author, speaker, and Christian recognized woman, Johnny Erickson Tata, is. Johnny is now 70 years old. When Johnny was in her late teens, she dove into a shallow section off of a dock. She dove into a shallow section of a dock into a lake. And for over 50 years, Years now, she has been a quadriplegic. She has a quote. It just means so much to me to listen to the eyes of a quadriplegic about pain, about trouble, about hardship. She says, though I might glance at the problems in my life, I am going to gaze continually in the eyes of my Lord and Savior. I kind of changed it up a little bit. Instead of perpetually gawking at all the problems, I don't have what Johnny has. I can't imagine. I had a dad that was incapacitated from a debilitating disease, but I don't have the pain and suffering that he went through or Johnny goes through. But instead of our perpetually gawking at all of the problems in life, are we able to simply be still and gaze into the eyes of our Lord and Savior? I want to ask you and me to do a little test this week. I would like us to look at what is the ratio of how much we are gawking at the world, gawking at statistics, gawking at the news, gawking at our devices, gawking at the newspaper and the, the postings and the social media versus how much time do you and I find ourselves gazing, gazing into the eyes and beholding the beauty of the Lord, our Lord, our strength, our refuge who is ever present in time of need. Because I think my ratio gets out of whack I think I get preoccupied with this world. And we need to be reminded from Psalm 46, do we have the intense, passionate relationship that nothing could rock that David describes in those four verses? That brings me now to the third and final stanza, verses 8 through 11. In order for us to grasp what is being stated in 8 through 11, we have to recognize and deal with the context. There's 8 and 9 sandwiched with 10 in there and 11. 
And those three verses, 8, 9, and 11, set the context for verse 10. I want us to for, open your Bibles, get back to Psalm 46 now, and look at 8, 9, and 11 with me. First of all, he says, come and see. Come and see, I ask the question, who brings devastation on the earth? Who? God does. There's three people I want to ask us real quick if we remember. You remember a guy named Job? Job's life was devastated. For the first three chapters, everything of any importance, his health, his family, his possessions, everything, gone. And then for 34 chapters, 34 long, laborious, drawn-out, pontificating around the pool of veracity, Three friends come and they go back and forth and back and forth with opinions and editorials and their theology that's warped and they try to fix or tell Job his problems and God finally says in chapter 38, 37 book chapters have gone by, he says in verse 38, Shh. still, Job, Sit and listen. And for the next four chapters, Job gets an education. At the end of the education, Job says, God, I thought I knew everything I needed to know about you. But it was just all head knowledge, it was just information, and it was not Total. It was not pure. It was not the essence of who you are. Then I knew. Now I see it. Now I see it. And I repent of anything that I would have ever said against you for the devastation that came to me. Elijah was the second one. Elijah had done this really cool thing that he felt really good about by roasting and toasting the prophets of Baal and their bull sacrifice. Not only did his sacrifice, when he called down the fire from heaven, consume his bull and the stones and the altar and the water and the ground, all the prophets bailed on their faces and he stalked them down and they massacred him. Now Jezebel, she's really perturbed about what Elijah has done, so she sends off people to scout him out and stalk him and haunt him. And what does Elijah do? Does he say, I am in the strength of the Lord God, my armies? No, he runs with his tail between his legs up to the mountains. Ah, I'm going to die, Jezebel's after me. And when he gets up there and he hides and the Lord comes, the Spirit of the Lord comes to look for him, and when the Spirit of the Lord comes, he doesn't go, what's wrong with you, Elijah? He says, Elijah, have something to eat. Have a burger and some fries. And, and Elijah does that. He hides and sulks some more. And God says, Elijah, what's going on, buddy? Here, have something to eat. Finally, he says, Elijah, what's going on? And Elijah just vomits the information. I've done this for you, God. I did the prophets of Baal. I served you. I did. <laughs> and he just goes on and on and he blabs it. And what does God do? Be still. Sit right here on the edge of the mountain and I want you to watch something with me. 1 Kings 19. And along comes fire. This amazing fire show. And then along comes wind and an earthquake. It all comes in. Elijah's going, whoa, you got to be in all of this. And yet the passage says, I'm not in that. And then all of a sudden comes Stillness, silence. God was in the still small voice. David, 
David, King David, oh, he had won so many recognitions, so many awards, was such a hero, ready to build the new tabernacle. And yet Nathan comes to him later in his life to have a word for him. And he says, God has told me to tell you, you are not going to be building the tabernacle. Huh? Wait a second. What do you mean? No, you're not going to be building it. Your son, your successor, Solomon, is going to be building the temple. And do you know what David did? It says in 2 Samuel 7 that David did one thing. It says, he sat. He sat down, he zipped his mouth, and he took in the reality. God, this, this tabernacle, my life, my success, it is not about me. The tribulations, the wars, the battles that have been won, the turmoil, the famine, the Israelites wandering, it's not been about me. It's been about you. It's been all along about you. But David had to just get down and sit and realize it's not about me. The second thing that happens in this stanza is this says, he makes wars. Who makes wars throughout the earth? Who shatters the bows and the, cuts the spears in pieces and sets wagons ablaze? Who? It's God who does this. Verse 11, to end the Psalm 46 says, Who is the one who is with us? Who is the one who is our stronghold? The Lord God of Jacob, the God of the armies, is our stronghold. So I want us to now do another Selah. I want us to ponder verse 10. You see, many translations use the word or the term be still. In Hebrew, it's hasha. And actually, it's really, really too tame. The Hebrew word in the actual language is the term harpo. And it's more like this. Stop your fighting. <laughs> Don't you love that, Jamie? Stop your fighting. Stop your wars. Stop your battles. Stop it. Cease striving. Sit down and knock it off or be quiet. That fits the context better. It's not this gentle sit down. It's not this, this, oh, come on now, you guys. Quit your being little rascals. Let's, let's get back to what we're supposed to be doing and following after God. No. It is stop your fighting, verse 10. Stop your fighting. Know that I am God, exalted among the nations, exalted on the earth. I don't know if you've ever had any vacations where on that trip there was some misbehaving family members. Did you ever have that kind of a thing happen? And you're on this long trip. I've had trips, I won't even go into detail of them. I've had trips where there's arguments and fights and bickering and complaining over long hauls. And this might happen in your vacation this summer. I had one of these trips where I took, we took 60 students down to Mexico and we drove straight through there. And I was in the only van that had vinyl upholstery, no air conditioning, and it was 110 plus degrees in Arizona going through it. And let's just say the students in the van were not happy. Imagine with me now in the text that God is displaying, displaying here that God does something that I remember my parents doing. Did you ever have a parent that did this? You're on this trip and everyone's getting agitated and all of a sudden the brakes are slammed on the vehicle. <laughs> Comes to a complete stop. I can so vividly picture the arm of my dad, maybe you can picture your mom, maybe you can picture someone else, reaching over the bench, over the chair, and saying to you, stop it right now. Well, imagine with me that I'm in this van, a very 
perturbed, angry, fighting, bickering individuals. And I slam on the brakes and I say, come with me. And the students all get out of the van, and this is, again, hypothetical. The students get out of the van, and they are just complaining. That's putting it nicely. They are complaining. They are hot. They are hungry. They are disagreeing. The elephant in the room is fully showing his colors, and there is debate and anger going on. And as I take them to where they do not know, I blindfold them, and then I bring them to an edge of a precipice. And I lean all 15 of them in, and I said, take off your blindfolds. And they find that they are on the rim of the Grand Canyon. And God says to us, I spoke and that happened. That sunset you're watching over there, I am controlling and making that happen. The stars that are beginning to fill the skies, not only have I numbered them, I have got an individual name for every single one of them. I even control the constellations that they're in. The breath that you're taking right now to argue with each other is the breath that I am giving you and I'm controlling it. God is saying in verse 10, be still. Cease your striving. Cease your arguing. Be still and know I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in every tongue and tribe and nation. One day every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess. We either have to get in the habit of recognizing that now because the reality is one day all of us are going to be doing a huge, who knows how long, bow of adoration and of complete humility towards the only one who controls the universe. And he controls what is going on in our world right this second. Do we believe it? Just like God had to reveal to Job, just like he had to reveal to Solomon and the Ecclesiastes, Habakkuk in chapter 3, even at the end of Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, do you notice that never once does God answer why? Now, we may want to look for a legislative answer. We may want to look for a physics answer, a philosophical, or even a theological answer. But they never get it. We never get it. It is never be still and know why. It's be still and know I am God. Faith, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is being sure of who our hope is in. Our hope. It's being certain of what we don't see. So how do we apply Psalm 46? You see, when you and I are being still and knowing he is God, number one, it keeps our hearts focused in the right place. Two, it gives Papa, it gives the Father, it gives us an opportunity to get his perspective over our perspective. Not my opinions, not my ways, not my thoughts, your thoughts. Three, it guides us to lead a life of walking justly, loving mercy, walking humbly before our Father. It's not about our flesh. It's not about our strength. It is not about my human opinion, ever. It helps us to trust and wait even in the darkness, regardless of the future. God has got us. So I challenge, there's going to be times to lay down our arms and our arguments and our opinions and our zealous doing, and it's going to be doing this, being still and knowing he is God, that God is in control. Are we willing to go to him again and again? Instead of listening to all the voices that are screaming for our attention, the loud, insistent voices Cease 
all human striving, run to the Father. Whatever we might be waiting for, the prolonged watching and waiting that's stretching us, it's developing a deeper trust in Him. Be still. Run to the Father. And if we're not at peace in the waiting, we're struggling. I know where you are. We're overwhelmed with fear and despair. Can we remember what Jesus told his disciples in John 16? I'm talking to you, Larry. I'm talking to all of us. Only in me will we have peace. Only in him. Yes, in this world there's going to be trouble, but be courageous. What does Jesus say? I have overcome the world. He's overcome it. Do we believe this? Are we feeding our hearts and minds with it? When it feels like everything is falling apart, and it's felt much like that in these last months, and everywhere we look, we see and we hear the devastation and pain. Be still. Be still and know that he is God. Run to his arms. When the pressure of our expectations, our roles, responsibilities, when the choices are weighing so heavily on our heart, be still and know that he is God. Run to him, people. Run to him, Crossroads family. Run to him, Larry, again and again and again. What does that look like? I want to share simply one example. And wherever you're at, whether you're here at Crossroads in the building, whether you're with your host group at home alone, wherever you're meeting, this is not an expectation. This is just an invitation. It's an offer. And it could be a posture that we get into or even just holding hands out and quietly waiting to reveal God, what do you have for us? I would like to show you one example of what it means for me. It could be different for you. It could be going to the war room. It could be going to the chair. It could be going to the, to the backyard. It could be going to a swing. It could be going... It could be just, just pulling yourself aside into a closet. But it's time. It's time for me to be still. It's time for the church to be still and listen to him, to release the anguish of our hearts, to seek his face. It's time to run to the Father. In the midst of such confusion, in a time of desperate need, when I'm thinking not too clearly, your gentle voice does intercede. Slow down, slow down, be still and wait on the Spirit of the Lord. Slow down 
and hear his voice and know that he is God in this time of apprehension when things are feeling so unsure when life is painful all around me comes a gentle voice so still so My child, be still and wait on the Spirit of the Lord. Slow down and hear His voice and know And know that he is God. Oh God, help me. Help our Crossroads family. Help the the church of Jesus Christ around the world. Cause us to be still and to find our faces gazing upon you. Filling our souls with the nourishment that only you can bring. Forgive us. Forgive me when I become enamored and gawking and preoccupied with the desperation of our world. Yes, break my heart, but God, remind me. You sent your son to die for this world, for me. And the thing that you want us to do is to bring you your love, your truth, your hope, your kingdom to our lost, lost world. Start with me. Start with me, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.